Hi everyone and welcome to another sound design lecture uh, where we will be showing some more web audio API functionality and this one's kind of different and kind of interesting because up to now all of the lectures have been dealing with basics and fundamentals what is procedural audio what is meant by sound synthesis uh, what is the web audio API about and how can you create simple beat sounds simple tones but Today, we're going to talk about bells and how you can create a realistic sound of a bell, uh, what are the techniques that are used, and what are ADSR curves and how they are um, used to create musical sounds. And we'll be introducing the concept of additive synthesis. So here we go. <coughs> so what I've shown on the right here is what's known as an ADSR curve. And there are variations on this. Um, the AHDSR curve, attack, hold, decay, sustain, release, and uh, or just attack and release curves. But this sort of structure is the structure for the amplitude level of most musical notes, of impact sounds, of essentially whenever one object hits another object, and sound is produced, it rises from inaudible to something loud and heard. This is the attack stage or the transient stage. Then it starts to decay, settling down into some fairly uniform behavior. Uh, so the starting to decay in that decay stage, settling down the sustain stage, and finally drops off to something quite inaudible, and that's the release stage. Now, in practice, most impact sounds, most musical notes, will have a much smoother transition from one stage to the next stage, and it will never fully be in a sustained stage. It will still be lowering in amplitude over that time period. But some structure like this is what one finds in a lot of musical notes, a lot of real-world phenomena, and it's a very common and useful tool in music analysis and audio signal processing. By specifying an ADSR curve, one can control a waveform's amplitude. One can shape how that waveform changes over time. And in this curve here, one has time represented on the x-axis and amplitude or intensity values on the y-axis. So when one specifies an ADSR curve, one typically specifies attack, decay, and release as time values, how many milliseconds of attack one has. Whereas one often specifies the sustain level as an amplitude level. But it can differ from implementation to implementation. So let's look at a nice demonstration of developing and listening to ADSR curves using the Web Audio API. So here is the website for which there is a link where the person behind this, he created this nice uh, sound and visualization tool. So over on the left, someone, you can specify the parameters of an ADSR curve. Over on the right are the actual lines in uh, the Web Audio API code, the JavaScript code, for specifying how a parameter value changes over time. So we've talked about this in previous lectures about creating a beep sound. Now we're creating a full ADSR curve. Hear how it sounds. Hopefully you can hear this okay, but if not, just go to the website and duplicate the steps that I'm doing. So I can change a few parameters here. Let's make the release curve at the end exponential. And let's make the decay value exponential. And let's make the attack time to be much, much longer. So. And you can see how the values over here change. We have an exponential ramp for the attack and here for the release. And it's true that exponential ramp is more meaningful perceptually when um, 
going in the attack stage, it very quickly ramps up and the ramp is typically exponential and all of the decay is also typically exponential. So if you want to create realistic sounds, usually one would use an exponential ramp rather than a linear one. Okay, so that's ADSR curves. Let's give an example of how they are used and it's going to introduce a few more concepts. We're going to try to build the sounds of a bell and I'm going to take the sound of Big Ben, a historic bell in uh, the center of London. It's actually quite a, a relevant one to use at the moment because at the time I'm recording this lecture, the bell is out of use. It's being uh, refurbished and um, uh, restored at the moment, which means you can't hear the sound. So let's see if we can synthesize that sound. So here's the sound of it from a recording by the BBC. <laughs> Now, that sound, well, let's, let's look at it. I'm going to jump ahead and then jump back. So this is the waveform, just amplitude values over time. And you can see it decaying with something like an exponential decay. On bottom, we have the spectrogram and it's, oh, sorry, we have the, the spectrum. It's basically a snapshot of uh, the frequency content ranging from the very low frequencies to the very high fre frequencies and the amplitude or strength of the signal for each of those frequencies. And it's a snapshot over time. So this is one uh, time somewhere in the middle of this waveform. What you can see on bottom is that there's a few dominant frequencies occurring over time. In the middle, we have a spectrogram which is basically showing the spectrum, but now on its side and snapshots of that spectrum over time. So how the spectrum is evolving over time. In the beginning, you have a few very, very strong frequencies. They tend to decay over time until there's just a few frequencies that are quite strong. There's some interesting behavior going on here. A frequency dies down, and reoccurs, dies down, reoccurs, and stays throughout. But the main behavior that's happening is each of these strong frequencies are dying out exponentially over time. So how can we model what's going on? We basically have a handful of frequency components and they're not changing much at all. They're occurring at the same frequency over all time. Frequencies are plotted on the y-axis in the spectrogram, on the x-axis in the spectrum. So the frequency values are roughly the same, but decaying in amplitude. Which means that our bell is mainly just these decaying harmonics or frequencies and some multiples of those frequencies. So we can model this by having a handful of oscillators, the, using the oscillator node in the web audio API, where each of those oscillators has its frequency set has an initial amplitude. So the initial um, strength of each of them, which is determined by how bright, how uh, bright yellow the values are, but we're concerned with what the values are initially, their strength, and the decay rate for each of those oscillators, how quickly it falls off towards an amplitude of zero. So, if we have that information, it is a form of what's known as additive synthesis to generate sound by just adding sine waves or oscillators together. Another approach to synthesis instead of additive is what's known as subtractive. Subtractive synthesis, one would generate the sound by starting with a very complex source, a very rich source, like pure noise and then removing frequencies or filtering out a lot of the content you don't want until you have just what's needed. So you can approach any sound by adding together lots of sine waves or by starting with all sine waves and removing those you don't want. But some synthesis techniques work better for certain types of sounds. 
ringing sound that is constituted of lots and lots of different sounds, very, very rich. You could probably start with a noise source and start shaping that source, changing amplitude a little bit, changing the strength of the relative frequencies and get something like rain. And rain is known as a sound texture, which is a sound whose properties stay roughly constant over time. If one is dealing with an impact sound, like plucking a string on a guitar, hitting a hammer against uh, a nail, any of those sounds, you have a burst of strong frequencies that decay over time. A small number of frequencies determine what's happening in the sound. So for that sort of sound, we use additive synthesis. And the idea of additive synthesis has actually been around a very long time. It comes directly from Fourier series, uh, sorry, Fourier theory, where Joseph Fourier showed that you can reconstruct any periodic wave just by combining sine waves, and multiples of those sine waves, uh, with appropriate phases and amplitudes. And in fact, here's a wonderful instrument designed by uh, Lord Kelvin. It's part of his Tide or Tidal Predicting Machine, which people believe was developed in 1876. And it had two main mechanical components, a harmonic analyzer and a harmonic synthesizer. The analyzer basically took information data about waves and broke that down to determine the frequencies in it, the harmonic synthesizer summed together those uh, sinusoid, sinusoidal oscillators to uh, create the periodic waveform that essentially predicted when the tides would occur. Anyway, so what we need to do for the bell sound is additive synthesis. It's an impact sound. A hammer strikes the bell or someone hits the side of the bell. The bell resonates, creates a burst of content, but very quickly settling down into a small number of frequency components, exponentially dying down over time. How do we do this in the Web Audio API? We're going to use the exponential ramp to a value at time. So. If you watch the beat lecture that I did, you're already familiar with this, although the example we gave there, I think, used the linear ramp to a value over time. If you look at the data that was shown previously, and this data came from a tool called Sonic Visualizer, by the way, then if you look at the strengths of these frequency components, they are decaying linearly in the, as decibel values. So if you pick any one of them, you have this sort of behavior where it's basically determined primarily by just the slope and the value of a particular frequency over time uh, is dependent just on some slope times the time plus whatever was the initial decibel value. Well, if you convert that to, instead of being in terms of decibels, but as a linear value, say just a, a linear gain that would be applied to an oscillator's amplitude, then you have this exponential decay or exponential ramp to some value over time. So we can work with that. We just need, if we store the decibel values there, and we know the slope of this curve, which one can get from analyzing the, uh, the waveform and the spectrogram information. If you have that information, then you can convert the decibel values to amplitudes and apply the exponential ramp to a value at a particular time on those amplitude values. So we start by setting the value of the gain applied to an oscillator. Here we have lots of oscillators for each of the different frequency components we want to work with. And down here, we will set the value at the current time for the gain to whatever it actually should be at the beginning, the, the initial or starting value of the amplitude. We get that start value by just converting from the decibel value to the amplitude value. Then we say that 
okay over eight seconds the keep in mind the x-axis here is not it's an arbitrary unit but over eight seconds it's going to drop to whatever the value should be at eight seconds which is determined by the slope here so that's what we do here we have an exponential ramp we're dealing with linear values of amplitude so an exponential ramp down to whatever the value should be after eight seconds and we reach that value at a time of the current time plus eight seconds i picked eight seconds just because it's in the middle of this decay curve so we're going to use that in building up the bell sound synthesis and we're going to add some form of user control if we have a set of oscillators then we can change the frequency of all of those oscillators to change the pitch of the sound that's produced. If we change how long it takes to decay to a certain value, then we change the duration of the sound. So rather than say taking eight seconds before it becomes inaudible or close to inaudible, we can um, make that take four seconds or 16 seconds. And we do that by dividing that slope value by whatever is the amount, the scaling factor, which we want to apply the, to the duration. So in short, if we want to increase the pitch by a factor of two, multiply all of the frequencies by two. If we want to increase the duration by a factor of two, divide that slope from the formula on the previous sli slide, divide that slope by the scaling factor for the duration. So let's look at the code. So here's Bells and I have it uh, available for you in the GitHub repository accompanying the slides. And first we have the HTML file where the HTML, just gonna make this look pretty for you. Okay, so here is the HTML code, and it's quite simple. Um, we have a single button for striking the bell. Then we can adjust the duration. We can scale it um, so that it's much lower, only one fifth or 0 0.2 times the actual duration as it was in the recording, or we can increase it to up to four times as long. We also can change the pitch, bring it down all the way to zero. So it becomes uh, zero hertz. It's just completely inaudible. There's no periodic behavior. Or we can uh, change the pitch so that it's higher, up to a factor of four higher. Then if we look at the code for the bells. So first, down here, I have... Um, the parameters and so these are measured values from the recording of the of the bell from analysis of that recording that there's 14 and i just picked an arbitrary cutoff there 14 strong frequency components we have the frequency values for each of those components we have the slope how quickly it's decaying over time and we have the initial amplitude for each of them we start off as soon as someone clicks uh, the strike button, we resume the context so that the audio graph is active. We specify arrays for the gain nodes and the oscillator nodes. We create each of the gain nodes, create each of the oscillator nodes, and we start the oscillators and we connect the oscillator to the gain. Now, so far, it's not going to produce any sound because nothing is connected to the destination. There's no output. You, we have a graph, but it's not connected so that we can hear the output from any speakers. And now we're going to set what is the current time. And for every oscillator, we do the following. Any scheduled values, we're going to cancel. There shouldn't be any scheduled values because we've just created this um, these nodes right here. 
but we then um, set the initial frequencies where we, or set the frequencies of each of these oscillators, where they can be adjusted by our pitch scaling. And we set the amplitudes or the gains of them, which is just converting the initial amplitudes to decibels. Then we have this exponential ramp occurring over eight seconds, just as mentioned in the slides. And then for the, it's not quite at zero. So there's still a very small sound coming out. So we have it ramped linearly all the way down to zero for an additional four seconds. So it's scaling exponentially and then just ramps down. And we also do it that way because we want it to end with a value of zero, but we want it to smoothly decay to zero and the exponential ramp won't go all the way down to a value of zero. It causes errors if you do. So we get it close to zero and then decay with a linear ramp the rest of the way. Let's hear how this will sound. So hopefully you hear this. If not, please just run the um, the code samples and try it out for yourself. And if you recall from the beginning of the lecture, that sounds rather similar to the original bell. We know it's going to be different. There's a lot more going on in the complexity of the bell, but amazingly close to it with a fairly simple model. And we can change the duration of that sound. So let's make it a very short sound. Let's make it a high pitch or a very low pitch. Very low, maybe not quite so low. A very deep bell. And that's it. That's additive synthesis for working with bell sounds. I'll show you a little more. The way it's constructed it creates new oscillators each time. So you can actually have multiple bell sounds playing on top of each other. Let's try that out. You might actually hear some artifacts there because it was generating many, many different oscillators at the same time. But that's the, the idea, and you can substitute the parameters of the bell with the sounds of other bells and create lots of different uh, impact sounds that way. So that concludes this lecture. As always, please get in touch if you have any comments or questions, and thank you very much.